Yeah, so right when we started, everything went down. The lights, the, the projector, everything but my laptop because it's on a battery. And, and the Wi-Fi didn't go down yesterday either, so that was kind of interesting. Yeah, they said it's powered over Ethernet, and so it must be a battery backup on the network somewhere, you know, in each building. I don't know, but everybody still had Wi-Fi, but it, no, no electricity, so it's crazy. So anyway, so it's, uh, it's a good day. We're going to get into internal energy and heat capacity. So we're really going to start getting into the bulk thermodynamics calculations today. And so this is, again, this section of the course and of the whole year, really, of your PCHEM uh, uh, career, <laughs> your year-long career in PCHEM. Uh, the whole fall semester was about quantum mechanics and spectroscopy. The spectroscopy piece was how we detect quantum effects. <clears throat> So it sort of showed that the data really matches a quantum view of reality. Uh, they were really skeptical about this in the, in the early 1900s because they had already developed sort of this bulk model of nature, uh, all of the thermodynamic properties of enthalpy and entropy and everything. And they didn't know how quantum mechanics fit into that. And so then the, the people like Boltzmann and Einstein that, that took the quantum view and re-derived all of the thermodynamic properties really showed that quantum can be used to explain the thermodynamic properties. And so that's what we're gonna be doing. That's called statistical thermodynamics. And we've been doing this up to this point, the Boltzmann distribution of microstates uh, in the units of an ensemble are a way to statistically calculate all of those possibilities, all of those populations of energy levels. And then this connects that quantum theory to bulk properties. And then from those, those bulk properties are all of the thermodynamic values that we've, um, we're familiar with. Now I just sort of pump them into one pronounceable initialism called UShag and K. K is the equilibrium constant. So this um, internal energy is U, entropy is S, of course, enthalpy is H. Now the, um, the, uh, Helmholtz energy is A and the Gibbs energy is G. You, you know the Gibbs energy, but Helmholtz is the same kind of concept, but at a constant volume. So all of these come out of this statistical treatment of thermodynamics. Now, it's gonna take a little while, like three or four lectures to go through each one of these. So today we're just gonna be focused on the heat capacity and the internal energy. But this will get us all the way to the equilibrium constant. Now, the, the easiest one to calculate, of course, would be gas phase equilibrium constants, but the, the science is developed for all of them, liquid, you know, aqueous, it doesn't matter. Okay, so it's, the, it's just the problem of getting the, the partition function for an aqueous um, reactant it would be really difficult to do. But, but we know that the, the science is there, the equations are there, we just don't really know the solutions to them. <clears throat> so let's focus on heat capacity and energy. Um, so we'll focus probably on energy first. So let's look at energy, the internal energy, U. So in that acronym or initialism, U-SHAG, we'll start with U. So the sum of all the energies of each quantized state times their probabilities of being populated gives that internal energy of the system. So there's going to be a couple of different ways we calculate the internal energy, and this is one of them, okay? You've seen this before. This was the expectation value that we saw in the probability lecture. So on the second day of class. And that was because this, uh, this piece right here is the probability of being in state I. So if we have the probability of being in state I times that energy, that's our expectation value. We did that with the darts. Remember we had a certain probability of red, blue, and green, and we had a dollar value and so we said, what's the expected return on this? And, and it was based on the areas. And we had, we came out with $1.22. But we pay it $1.50, but we expected $1.22. So over time, we're going to lose money. Now, we might get, get lucky because, you know, with a small sample, you don't get the nice average expected value. And you throw your dart, you pay $1.50, you throw your dart, and, uh, and you hit the red circle, okay? And you get five bucks. Walk away. <laughs> it's not going to get better than that ever. All you're going to do is dilute your winnings. And so, um, so you're, you've hit a, a statistical anomaly and, and I'm telling you, it's, you're not going to win any more than that. Okay. So, 
So this is a decision point when calculating internal energy, you know, a problem may say calculate the internal energy for this system. And if you can count the number of energy levels, then use this, this formula. Okay. Now, what are some situations where you can't count the number of energy levels? Um, translation, rotation. Okay. So you really can't count those, um, even vibration to some extent. So really, if you're dealing with a molecular system, you're not going to use this equation. You're going to use this equation if it's a two-level system, three levels. Even if it's a five-level system, it'll be a long calculation. You may want to use Excel, but you would use this equation. So you find the partition function, or you find each individual uh, Boltzmann factor for each level, then add them up. That's the partition function. Then you create your probability columns, and then you multiply probability by energy, and you add all of those up, and that's the calculation. And that would give you the internal energy for, you know, again, a countable number of energy levels. Okay. So the sum of all those energy levels times their probabilities gives the internal energy of the system. And then from the internal energy and the partition function, you can calculate all these other thermodynamic properties. So I put a star on this page because this is your equation sheet. Okay, this is going to have all of those equations. Um, once we have the internal energy, notice that internal energy goes here and the partition function that we calculated goes here and that gives us the entropy. And then once we have the entropy, well, once, yeah, from the internal energy, we can calculate the, the enthalpy as well. So the internal energy can also help us calculate the enthalpy. And then we use the entropy and the internal energy to calculate the Helmholtz free energy. And if we're not, that's if we're in a constant volume, which again is, is used a lot of times in chemical engineering because you have a reaction vessel. And so if you're looking at whether this reaction is spontaneous at high pressure, low pressure, or whatever, you're not at a constant pressure at a constant volume. So you can run the pressure up to make your reaction go, um, or if it's low pressure, you can pull a vacuum on it and drop the pressure. But most of the time in academia, we use the Gibbs free energy because it's at constant pressure and all of our glassware and everything's open to the atmosphere. So if it generates pressure that's still at one atmosphere, okay, so the volume's not really fixed, it can expand, it can, it can contract. Um, so the, the, um, if, it's, uh, if you're looking for spontaneity at, at constant pressure, then you use the enthalpy and the entropy to get the Gibbs free energy. So these are all of the equations that you can calculate once you know the internal energy and the the uh, partition function. Now this would be for your particular species, your reactants and your products, right? You would calculate enthalpies, entropies, uh, Gibbs energies, and then products minus reactants would be your deltas, delta H, delta G, delta S. So products minus reaction, reactants, you take into account the number of moles and all of that, and you're then able, able to calculate all of your deltas, see if it's exothermic or endothermic, um, if it's delta G, we use the term erg, so endergonic, exergonic. So if it releases energy or takes in energy, uh, energy and heat are not exactly the same. Okay, they both have energy units, but but heat would be a random loss of energy, um, and uh, and energy can also be changed in terms of work. So we can do work with it. So if it's doing work, it's not heat. Okay, if it's losing heat, it's doing less work. So at the high temperature limit, then we have this idea of equipartition of energy. So let's take that word apart before we do anything mathematical with it. So we talked about the partition function. Remember that? That's how we partition the atoms, molecules, or ions, or whatever, in all the different quantum states. So what happens if we put equa in front of that? Same, right? They have the same population. I mean, we're just populating everything equally. There's no statistical difference between all of the options. And that's what you have if your energy spacing is really close together and your temperature is way up here, that, that there's no probabilistic difference between my thumb and my pinky, okay? 
So it's an equal probability that we would be in any one of those states. And that's what we have in this situation. So at high temperature, we have equal partition. So we could put molecules in all of the levels. There's really no difference between a vibration, a rotation, or anything like that. And the translation, rotation, vibration, all those individual partition functions that we calculated, they pretty much go away. So I really just showed you that to build a bridge over to the partition function and the molecular partition function. I also wanted you to see how Gaussian was calculating those things. But in, 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 in reality, we use these simplified equal partition um, energies. So at high temperature, the volume is so much greater than the, that uh, thermal wavelength that this just converges to three halves times the number of moles times the gas constant times the temperature. So three halves nRT. So we get one half nRT for every degree of freedom. And so we have, uh, you know, three degrees of freedom. So we have three halves nRT. And so let's just check the, the units. This is moles. Okay. This is joules per mole Kelvin. So that would be the 8.31. Four, five, and then this is Kelvin. So you see this gives joules, internal energy. Okay. If you want it in joules per mole, then you could just essentially take that in over here and you end up with the energy per mole. And then the Kelvin cancels, but your R gas constant still leaves it in joules per mole. So if you want to write it in joules per mole, just don't, don't calculate the number of moles. Just leave it as joules per mole. But if you have 10 moles of gas, then you need to put in 10 moles and actually calculate the joules of 10 moles of gas. So just sort of pay attention to whether your energy is being calculated in joules per mole, or if you know the number of moles of gas, go ahead and put it in there and you calculate it's in joules, internal energy in joules. Okay. So we have three degrees of freedom, you get half an NRT for each, <laughs> said that. So here's the uh, rotation. This is for nonlinear rotation. So we have three degrees of freedom for that one a half of nRT for our X, our Y, and our Z. Okay. Linear molecules only have two, so that would be two halves. We're going to go ahead and write two halves instead of just nRT uh, because we're going to have three halves and we might have two halves. We're going to add them up, so might as well keep them in, in terms of halves, and we end up with five halves for a linear molecule, six halves for, uh, for a nonlinear molecule. Okay. And then for vibration, it's a little strange. Uh, when the temperature is hot or above like 10 times the vibrational temperature, which is pretty rare. So you can almost always, I will say, for simplification, you can just neglect the vibrations for small molecules, just not even calculate them for their internal energy because you have to be at 10 times the, the vibrational temperature for them to be active. And so now we end up with uh, two halves for each activated vibration. And so there's going to be an, an NRT for every active vibration. So we'll summarize these in, in a little bit. Okay, so this is another decision point. Now here's, we've got the translation plus the rotation plus the vibration. And we would use these molecules if we see that we're dealing with moles of particles or if we see equal partition in the, in the problem and so on. So do you see what I mean by decision point? Here's a calculation for the internal energy, the, the U total is equal to U trans plus U rote plus U vibration, right? So if you have a molecule or it's like argon gas or something at room temperature or, or nitrogen gas at room temperature, you would add up the translation, the rotation, and the vibrational energies for those molecules, and that would be your total internal energy. Do you see how we're not counting energy levels? We're not getting into the translations and the rotations. We're calculating the degrees of freedom but we're not counting individual energy levels to come up with Q. You don't see Q anywhere in this, you don't, yeah. And that's a, in contrast to this earlier one when I was saying you have this decision point here, right? If you can calculate the internal, the energy levels, then you can use this equation for the internal energy. So if you have five energy levels or three energy levels, then this is the one you use. I'm just sort of emphasizing that because so many students in the past have gotten confused by that. Like, which equation do I use for internal energy? Okay, so I'm just trying to pound that home. If it's equal partition or if it's the number of molecules or, or uh, uh, ideal gas at room temperature, you can't use this one. How are you going to sum up all of the probabilities? 
of all the energy levels. There's just no way. It's an uncountable number. Even for argon at room temperature in one atmosphere was 10 to the 30. That's a long sum. You know, we could do those integrals and so on and use Gaussian's equations, but um, at really high temperatures, it simplifies to this. So this is super easy. Okay. All right. Now, but we didn't have electronic on there and we've already kind of covered this, but we'll reemphasize re it. So that thermal excitation to an electronic energy level. So going from say a, a, the HOMO to LUMO transition is almost never considered because uh, the temperatures needed are greater than the bond energies. So again, if, even if we excited everything, we would have an equal number of antibonding and bonding states. And so the molecule would fall apart. So let's talk about heat capacity. So here's our first definition of this term, heat capacity. Okay. And this down here, this, this subscript means constant volume. There are two types of heat capacities. There's a constant volume heat capacity and constant pressure heat capacity. So if you see a little subscript of P, that'd be a heat capacity at constant pressure. This is heat capacity at constant volume. So I've had to move the little trans for translation. I had to move it up to a superscript so that, that we could um, see that this is a CV that we're calculating, not a CP. And this is the, um, the definition of heat capacity. It's the partial derivative of uh, the internal energy with respect to temperature. So how does energy change with temperature? Now for the, um, the Boltzmann distribution function and the partition function, we could get in there and derive, you know, take the derivative of that for like a two level system and calculate it. But for this one, for equal partition, it's super easy. So here's my internal energy for translation and what's the derivative of that with respect to temperature? It's just the coefficient of temperature. It's temperature to the first power. And so it's three has NR. And so looking at those, uh, those units, that would be moles and joules per mole Kelvin. Okay. So that heat capacity is really just going to be joules per Kelvin. It looks a lot like the Boltzmann constant. Since in, set, in fact, the Boltzmann constant is, is a heat capacity. I mean, it's how many joules in nature uh, change for every Kelvin. So think about it. It's changing joules or changing Kelvin. So that's what a heat capacity is. How much energy can I take in before my temperature goes up one degree? Okay. And for metals, it was, it's, we've determined it's about, you know, say 0.6. So it takes in 0.6 joules and that metal goes up a degree of Kelvin. For water, it's four, like 4.2. So it takes four, 4.2 joules before temperature, the water's temperature goes up one degree. So do you see how water has a higher capacity for heat? It can take in four joules of heat before the temperature goes up one degree and metal only 0.6 and before it goes up one degree. So do you see how this term, this heat capacity term makes sense? Just the, the language, the grammar. I'm really pretty happy with some of the language of, of PCHEM. It's a lot of it just makes sense. Equipartition, you know, heat capacity. These things, they have a uh, um, and not everything, but, but a lot of these terms really do. Just If you just think about what the term is, it makes sense. Heat capacity. How much heat can something take in before the temperature goes up one degree? Okay. And you kind of think of a bucket, like a, a metal is kind of like a grad cylinder. You put a little bit of volume in and the temperature rises real fast. And water is like a big bathtub. Put a lot of energy in and the water rises just a little bit. So it has a bigger capacity. So rotation, uh, so for two different types, linear rotation, again, the, the derivative of uh, that is two halves NR, nonlinear rotation, three halves NR. And then for vibration, we just have, again, NR. Now, this is uh, for vibration, we talked about the number of active modes. And so I've introduced a new little term here, this A. And so A is the number of active modes. Since there's three N minus six vibrations, there might be a few vibrations that are active. Uh, they're really low frequency vibrations. Um, but again, for room temperature, I'm gonna make the call because whenever I'm making problems, 
and I say calculate the heat capacity at room temperature, A would be zero at room temperature. We'll see at the end of this lecture that it's not, but, but there's really no easy way to know. And so we're dealing with small molecules. And so uh, like water and ammonia and those things, A is essentially zero. So it's a safe assumption. And then when T is oh, greater than 10 times that, uh, that vibrational temperature, the mode becomes active. And so then we get another unit of NR for every one of those active vibrations. This is the actual reason why all of our different substances behave differently. Notice how the translation and the rotation has nothing in there related to the mass of the particle. So that's totally independent of what that molecule is. So the internal energy of argon uh, gas, the translational piece is the same as the internal energy of um, nitrogen or benzene or whatever. There's, there's no identity of the particle in there. At least for translation, it makes no difference. Rotation, there's linear versus nonlinear. And atoms don't rotate. So you can't have a rotational piece for argon. You might want to write that down. So monatomic gases have no rotational component. A lot of people mess that up. So if I'm asking you to calculate the internal energy for nitrogen, you would include the, the linear rotational piece. If I ask you to calculate it for neon, there's no rotational piece. It's just translation. Yeah. And if I ask you to calculate it for water, uh, you have to take the, the translation and the nonlinear rotation. So those three would be different. Not neon versus nitrogen gas versus water. Okay, but you're not calculating a difference between uh, nitrogen gas and oxygen gas because they're both linear. They're going to have exactly the same internal energy if they have the same temperature because it's in the rotations and the, the translations. Those We have equal partition for those, and so it's there's really no statistical difference between those two. Um, just so, to be clear, um, I learned, at, I was taught in chemistry, if I ever saw the terms, you know, pick an element gas that meant it was diatomic, which I mean, yeah, well, it's linear, but for you, when you say nitrogen gas or, or oxygen gas or argon gas, yeah. you're not necessarily meaning diatomic. Well, I am for nitrogen and oxygen, but uh, the noble gases are monatomic. Okay. So that's uh, either, either mistaught or misremembered. Yeah. So that, that, that uh, noble gas column is going to be single atoms. Um, but but uh, chlorine, fluorine, oxygen, nitrogen are diatomics. And then uh, iodine too, the vapor, iodine vapor. I guess bromine has a decent iodine, but has a decent vapor too. But yeah, so the halogens for sure are diatomic. Um, oxygen and nitrogen. I'm not, I've never seen any problems where we have sulfur or phosphorus or anything like that. So I think that's it. It's really just those non-metals. But really making that mental distinction between the noble gases, which are all single atoms, and all the others that we talk about in the gas phase would be diatomic. Yeah. So great, great comment. Okay, so then this is the total. So we just add up those heat capacity components for each of the different pieces if they apply. Okay. So at room temperature, we're not going to worry about the vibrations. Uh, for single atoms like the noble gases, we're not going to deal with the rotations. And for molecules, we need to know if it's linear or not to know which rotation to use. So it's not that many things to, ca to, to keep track of, but it's enough to get confused if you're not paying attention. So be meticulous in calculating these. Okay. They're really easy calculations, so it's really sad to mess them up, <laughs> right? It could be three halves RT for a single gas, like a single atom gas, atomic gas. It would be five halves RT total for the uh, diatomics, okay? Six halves RT for vent molecules like water or, you know, methane, any kind of, you know, non, uh, non-linear molecule, six halves RT. And then the maximum value, the maximum value would be A was, A is equal to uh, 3N minus six. A equals 3N minus six for maximum uh, values. 
So max U and max CV, right? So we could calculate what's the maximum internal energy um, at uh, this temperature. So we pick that temperature and we calculate all of these. And then we have in there also the three N minus six times the number of moles times the temperature, the times R. Okay. So if we want the internal energy, we put temperatures on all of these. We multiply all these by temperatures. If we want heat capacities, we leave the temperatures off. We're just sort of calculating that coefficient. Okay, are there any things that I need to clarify on this? Because I want to, you will have lots of calculations of this, so I just want to make sure that you're good. Okay, so then uh, let's, here's another way to simplify it. So the total, or, or um, so let's go ahead and do a problem. Go ahead and get your pencils out and your calculators because this is a numerical problem. So go ahead, you're going to have to multiply by R and all of that stuff. So. Uh, yeah, let's go ahead and do that. So you want to write this down. We're going to be used the 8.3145 uh, joules per mole Kelvin. So that's R. If we want to leave it in per mole, so here I've, I've moved in over to the left. So we have this total CV. And then we have the translational piece, the rotational piece, the vibrational piece, if they're active. If, again, if they're room temperature, A is zero at all times R. So it's just how many units of R you have for a particular gas. And so here we are for ozone. So let's jump over to top hat. And so we'll we'll leave the, the calculation in joules per mole Kelvin. So it's just it's, a, it's going to just be a, a number of times times R. We'll go ahead and multiply that out. Is the join code the same every time? I don't know. Okay. Is it okay? Yeah. Okay. I just never had noticed. I've talked about ozone. <laughs> do you remember how to do the, the little stop for that? structures. Because that central atom has three domains, it's bent. So that'll help you in the problem. You may be wondering, hopefully not, but you're like, why do I need to know that? <laughs> <laughs> Does it tell you right away if you got it right or wrong? No, okay.
Oh, I wanted you to calculate it at room temperature. Oh, at room temperature. At room temperature, sorry. Yeah, so A is zero for that. Yeah, yeah. Will it let you change your answer? It should. Yeah. I thought I put that in the problem, but I didn't. I can see right here. Oh, it says max. Then no, then then A is three minus six. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry, sorry. It says max. So A is three minus. All right. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I keep screwing up. So maximum constant volume heat capacity. Thank you, Tommy. Yes. So A is three and minus six. <laughs> And y'all can talk to each other. I know you're kind of whispering, but you don't have to whisper. We have people drop off, people leaving. <laughs> does, it, does it dump you out if you don't enter or something? We had 15, and now we're down to 11 participants, I guess. Oh, back up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was an, uh, 11 of 12, and then it went 12 of 13, like they both changed at the same time. <laughs> okay, I'm going to, anybody trying to insert one more answer, or are we good? Okay, let's go on. I'm going to move on. It just, we'll, you'll, you'll figure it out. So, um, all right, so we're going to stop the answering. Here's our answers. Yeah, okay. So I put like a 5% um, uh, uncertainty in the answer. So it's around 50, okay? So let's see. Good job on you guys. All right. So let's we'll calculate. Um, let's do another one, actually. Let's do, what is the room temperature? So what's a good estimate for room temperature constant volume heat capacity for ozone? So good estimates for small molecules have no active vibrations. So now that you've struggled through the last one, this one ought to be a lot faster. You probably could just, you know, hammer it out on your calculator. Yeah, good, much faster, much improved.
Okay. I'm tempted to move on because it's got to be pretty quick. It's just three halves plus three halves. So it's six times R divided by two or just three times R. So um, you got what's eight times eight times three is 24. So it ought to be close to 24. So let's, go. let's see what we get. Very nice. So between 23.6 and 26.1. Uh, so good job, everyone. And okay, so we'll go to the next slide. Okay, so then we have um, again very simple calculation, and you don't have to do the three plus three, so six halves times r and then divide by two you can take six divided by two and get to three and it's three times r so um, with five halves i don't know you can make it two and a half if you want so here's what's going on with a diatomic as it's really really cold okay it comes up so like here's absolute zero but we really rarely see really 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 cold molecules and that was one of the things that that um, einstein fixed but right away, it comes up to three halves. So that's the translational heat capacity, right? So this is right here, CV translation. But this, this drop off, when in the fall, when we went through the four failures of classical physics that led to uh, quantum thinking, uh, three of those were spectroscopic, the hydrogen atom, line spectra of hydrogen atom, the photoelectric effect. So electrons would come off of this metal surface, but below a certain wavelength uh, or, or above a certain wavelength, they wouldn't. So they didn't understand why the electrons seemed to be bound. And then, you know, you would think that they could come off with any kinetic energy, that there wouldn't be a threshold. Um, and they were sort of discovering orbitals at that point. And, and then, uh, and then the, the third one that was spectroscopic was the black body radiator that that the curve of heat coming off of any object was the same no matter what the object was made of and so it was this strange phenomenon of black body radiation so those three were spectroscopic the fourth one i said was the heat capacity dropped off below its classical value of three halves r at cold temperatures and they had no way to explain that you know so um, they just thought this was a material property that the heat capacity, sort of nature's base heat capacity was three halves R. And then um, it could get bigger than that, but it couldn't get any lower than that. And then if they cooled it down, they started to see it drop off. And so they couldn't explain that from classical physics. We really didn't explain that with spectroscopic methods in the fall. We had to wait till now to explain it. And that's when those translations sort of become quantized. Okay, so the quantum effects of translation starts to drop off um, then as you as you warm up let's say you have a diatomic it warms up then you get that five halves r that rotational piece and so now it can hold more energy in a given temperature because it's got the rotational manifold that it has access to it has access to the translational manifold and then you start activating those rotations and now you can you have enough temperature that you can populate those rotational energy levels so again, that increases your capacity. I can put more energy into the molecule without increasing its temperature. Do you see how weird that is? Think about what I just said. I can put more energy into a molecule without increasing its temperature, a substantial amount, okay? So we're saying it has different slopes. That's what heat capacity is, energy in temperature. So they have a, a different slope, okay? And then, so like five halves versus six halves, right? A bent molecule has a more gradual slope. I can put more energy in and the temperature doesn't rise very much. Okay. So actually the, the, the heat capacity would be the energy on the y-axis and temperature on the x-axis. And so I could put more energy in and temperature doesn't change much. So it has a higher heat capacity. And then you, if you start to activate those vibrations, then you end up with for a diatomic, you only have one vibration, okay? And so then you add another two halves to the five halves, and so we end up with seven halves R. So here we have translation, rotation, and vibration are all active. And then if you keep putting in energy, you get the dissociation of the two atoms. So we split apart the bond, and now we have two atoms 
uh, and it's just translation. So that's what that T is for. And then we have a heat capacity of three because it's it's three halves for each of the atoms, but we have two atoms, so we have two moles. So it adds in another another um, set of three translations. So again, that molecule breaks apart, and even a homo to lumo transition in 700 nanometers would be a 20,000 Kelvin temperature. So let's look at some real heat capacity data. So we did all of this heat capacity stuff. It's all very theoretical. It's so and so many numbers of R in terms of the heat capacity. So I went to the CRC and, and pulled out about 20 uh, or so interesting molecules and, and some atoms too, like gaseous, argon. You could, I mean, heat up anything like copper and mercury and get that to be in the vapor phase. And so, um, so the three halves R would be our theoretical you know, using equipartition, this is our, our theory, he's right here. So the theory would predict that these would have a, a uh, heat capacity of 12.47. So three halves are for the, for the gaseous atoms. So all of these are different gaseous atoms. And we're saying that they're the same. It doesn't matter what kind of atom it is. It has the same, um, equipartition heat capacity. Then for the diatomics, bromine, carbon dioxide, or linear, not necessarily diatomic, linear molecules like this, uh, they have a heat capacity of three halves and two halves, so five halves are, so this would be our theoretical number for all of those. If it's linear, that's what it's going to be. And that's again joules per mole Kelvin. And then for the bent molecules, water or nonlinear molecules, water, ammonia, um, I saw this thionitrosyl fluoride. And the only reason I picked that was because it had the, the molecular formula NSF, like the National Science Foundation. So I thought that was cool. Mm -hmm. but, but actually the N is in the middle <laughs> of that molecule. So it's FNS, but, but I saw that. I thought that was cool. So I grabbed that molecule. Um, acetone, benzene, even carbon 60. Our model is kind of weak in that it would give the same heat capacity for carbon 60, a nonlinear molecule, as it would for water. Okay. Whereas Carbon sixty has sixty atoms. Think how many how many um, vibrations would that be? Three n is three times sixty, so that's one hundred and eighty minus six. Okay, so one hundred and seventy four. So it probably has a higher heat capacity than water. Some of those vibrations are probably going to be active. Okay, so our assumption at room temperature that a gas phase molecule is uh, only going to have you know no active vibrations well at room temperature c60 is not a gas okay so if it's a gas phase molecule at room temperature it's probably a small molecule and probably has high high frequency vi vibrations okay so let's look at the real real things here so here argon is very close to the theoretical value uh, gaseous copper gaseous mercury also pretty close to the theoretical value so that's neat i mean it works for a small noble gas or a really big bulky mercury. Aluminum and uranium, not exactly sure why they're higher, okay? But they're higher. They have a little bit higher heat capacity than the theoretical value. Let's look at bromine and carbon dioxide, these linear molecules. Uh, a, a bit higher, okay? It does make sense that all these would be higher because there are other things a molecule can do. The vibrations might be partially activated. Okay. And then in water, you see water is very close to the to the theoretical value because those vibrations, the bend is 1,500 wave numbers. The CH stretch is 3,000 wave numbers. So divide those by 0.7 and you get the vibrational temperature. So it's really hard to activate the vibrations in water. But in carbon-60, <laughs> That's the heat capacity for C60. Yeah, so it's not quite the theoretical value. <laughs> you calculate 25 and the answer is 500. <laughs> You're off a little bit. <laughs> yeah, and so I went through here and just kind of looked to see what the differences are. And, and if we like put those in the, um, in the active vibrations, even though there's no vibrations in a single atom, okay? Um, so it's not really doesn't really make sense. I put you know percent active not not applicable because there are no vibrations there. Um, so for bromine, it's higher by six 
uh, which is uh, like 83% of that bromine stretch is activated. So instead of A being one, it's like 0 0.8. And that would get you the experimental value. Um, for carbon dioxide, that bend is 600 wave numbers. It's not fully activated uh, at room temperature, but it's like 24% active. And there's really, I mean, you might be able to calculate those with those, just the vibrational partition function, because that's, that's known. Here's water. It's only 1% activated uh, in terms of its vibrational modes. Um, in the, uh, in acetone, benzene, and so on, these are all like ranging from 43% active down to 20% active. But you see there's some vibrational activation in all of these other molecules. Okay. So you could probably take on these larger molecules, sort of the, the average of these and say, if I activate 25%, so if I make A, um, three N minus six times 0.25, then I would get pretty close to an experimental correction. That would that would get me really close to C60. That would get me really close to benzene. Uh, I would be a little bit under on the NSF molecule. I'd be overshooting it for water and ammonia. Those molecules are just so small. And so, but, but you could come up with, again, you've got your theoretical value. You know it's not gonna quite match that. How many vibrations are active um, for a, benzene type molecule, kind of a bigger floppy molecule, you could activate 25% uh, of those 3N minus 6. And that would apply even all the way up to C60. So, uh, let me just sort of give you some encouragement. We've got two minutes, so a little philosophical moment, okay? What you're calculating, these things don't seem that important here in the classroom, okay? But every combustion engine, every turbofan, every Every engine we use depends upon heat capacity of a gas. So I just kind of want to sit on the heat capacity for a second and say this is a really important uh, calculation in thermodynamics. And, and how that gas expands, how much energy I can put into that gas is all sitting on heat capacity, at constant volume and heat capacity, at constant pressure, okay? And y'all have made it to the point where you are going to be able to calculate the world's problems. It's the world has problems that are solved by PQM. And, and so you are in a really rare situation. We have 21,000 students in this school. How many are in this classroom? <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. It's a, it's just, I want you to just kind of think about it and be encouraged. And every one of you deserves to be here. There's no imposters here. You wouldn't get here if you didn't work your butt off to be sitting in that chair. So just chew on that and have a good day. Yeah. Um, let's see.